on to Oceana! That's where you want to be! History happened everywhere. My name is Pete Goddard and I'm here in the HAT studio with the Oceania to my Eurasia. It's Mr. Ryan Weir. Surely Eurasia. My Asia. No, that is a reference, Ryan, to the book 1984, where the three superpowers include Oceania and Eurasia. Well, that might get a little mention and a nod later on. Literary ref. Now, last week, the Dursleiter gave us for episode 89, Mind the Gap in Oceania during 1644 to 1912, which we all know is the Qin Dynasty. So what have the listeners got in store for today, Ryan? Well, look, in this week's episode, we are going to be taking a very careful step into a watery world of wonder. We're going to meet a loudmouth lifesaver with a voice that echoes for eternity. We're going to meet the remarkable islander whose gift with the gab helped discover a world down under, and we're going to ignore all water and go for a walkabout through the middle of a giant caterpillar. Welcome to the land of reefs. Welcome to the coral seas. Welcome to Oceania. All right, Ryan. Well, I have so many questions and so much excitement. Where's the gap? What's the gap? Why should I mind it? What's in Oceania? Where is Oceania? Is it even Oceania or is it Oceana? I've got so many questions, Ryan, and I want you to answer them. Well, look, Pete, that's a lot of questions. Hopefully I can answer some of those for you. But let's start with a simple one. Oceana. It's the collective name given to all of the various islands that are sprinkled across the Pacific Ocean between Asia and the Americas. For a long time, it's been considered one of the six great divisions of Earth. You'll have heard of Europe, you'll have heard of Asia, you'll have heard of Africa, North America, South America, and then there's also Oceania. Very much the plus one of the continents then. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Now, definitions vary, but in general, it includes a lot of the Pacific Islands you'll be familiar with. Places like Australia, Fiji, Kiribati, Nauru, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, Tonga, Vanuatu, and a whole bunch of others. Now, geographically, though, Oceania also includes Hawaii and Rapa Nui, which you'll know as... The... Easter Island. Easter right. Island, yes. I was right up on that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but because those are politically linked elsewhere, Easter Island is part of Chile, Hawaii part of North America, they're not really considered official members of Oceania, even though there isn't really an official thing. Oh, well, that's confusing for the poor souls. It's all a little bit confusing and everybody has their own little take on it. But combined, all these land masses together, they equate to around 8.5 million square kilometres. 3.2 million miles, Pete. 15 times the size of France. Ooh. A lot of the heavy lifting there being done by Australia, I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I get that. Another set of plus ones. Australia and the rest. <laughs> <laughs> now, that is a large area, Pete, and taken as a whole. It's widely considered to be one of the world's best places for natural beauty. It's home to rainforests, volcanic mountains, vast deserts, white sandy beaches, atolls, the Great Barrier Reef, and, of course, the majestic fjords of New Zealand. Yes, the fjords. I always think of New Zealand when people say fjord. <laughs> yeah, obviously. <laughs> uh, it's also home to a huge variety of animals too, Pete. You've got kangaroos, koalas, frill-necked lizards, bats, tree frogs, lorikeets, birds of paradise, crocodiles, sharks, and a whole bunch of snakes and spiders that are going to happily murder you just for existing. Yeah, it's a continent of murderous creatures, isn't it? We all know that. <laughs> yes. Now, despite all that landmass, though, Oceania is home to just 42 million million people. That makes it the second least populated area on Earth outside of Antarctica. Wow. Pretty barren, right, in terms of humanity. I'm sure the planet will cope. <laughs> <laughs> now, across the region, English and French are the official languages, but many indigenous languages are also spoken. Similarly, Christianity is the main religion, but hundreds of indigenous beliefs are also followed too. Now, sadly, there is no one flag that represents the whole of Oceania. Uh, each 
each country and territory sort of has its own flag instead. But if one did exist, Pete, we could probably imagine it having a deep blue sea-coloured background, perhaps a circle of golden stars representing the main island groups. Is that the EU flag you've just described? <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't point that out, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Upon reflection, it sounds a lot like the EU flag. Now, there is no official anthem for Oceana either, Pete, but in the fictional world of the dystopian novel you mentioned, 1984, the main protagonist, Winston, is said to live in a totalitarian superstate called Oceana. And in the movie adaptation, released in 1984, there is a national anthem for Oceana. Oh, really? Written by Dominic Muldoni, the anthem is called Oceana Tis for Thee, and it sounds a little something like this. Well, that's dramatic. Isn't it? So... Uh, Dominic Muldoni said that Oceana Tis For Thee, this anthem, was inspired by... I wonder if you can guess what. Is it the Soviet Union? And? The... Nazi Party. Oh, right. Yeah. Oceana Tis For Thee, it's an anthem that plays a crucial role in manipulating the population. Pete, uh, it's used during the, in quotes, two minutes hate, a daily public ceremony designed to channel citizens' anger towards enemies of the state. Yeah, I've always wondered how they restricted them to two minutes, to be honest with you. <laughs> Let's have a minute of hate for each other. Yeah, I hate you, Ryan. I hate you, Pete. You suck. God. Rubbish at podcasting. You get bad grades. You are part of the reason I get bad grades. <laughs> yes, I am, yeah. <laughs> All right, there we go. That was it. All right. Pretty nice. Oceana facts! <laughs> You're going to do yourself a mischief doing that one day. Oh, yeah, it's just going to pop, isn't it? Just, uh, <laughs> it's right at the beginning of the episode as well, so it'll just screw me for the rest of it. Right. I say Oceana facts, but the reality is uh, Australia facts came out as being wildly more entertaining for me. So I thought I would start with something that uh, caught the imagination and uh, linked with our time period. Oh, uh-huh. ho. Yes. So 1644 to 1912 is the Chin Empire period. And there is something in Australia longer than the Great Wall of China. No. Yeah, man-made. It is a dingo fence. Oh! Yeah, it's a fence that runs over 5,614 kilometres long. Wow. I was just about to ask if that was the fence in rabbit-proof fence, but then I realised the clues were all there to tell me it was a different fence. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it was to keep the dingoes from the rabbits. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. But it's not the only big thing, Pete. Australia is literally dotted with big things. Things. Uh, 150 <laughs> big things across the country. I picked some of those that caught my eye. So the first one I want to tell you about is the big mango. Oh, the big mango. Yeah, it's a 10 metre high mango. That is exciting. Or rather a sculpture of a mango anyway. Yeah, it's in Bowen in Queensland. And it's to signify the area's mango farming. Where do they get their ideas from? <laughs> yeah. In uh, Dadswell's Bridge, Victoria, there is a massive sculpture of a big koala, 14 metres in height. Wow. I do like a koala. They're terrible creatures, really, but uh, you've got to kind of love their cuddliness. Yeah. A 14 metre one, you've got to love it. Otherwise, it will kill you. That would be the cutest monster in a Godzilla movie. Godzilla <laughs> versus Mecha Koala. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of big things that'll kill you, Pete, the big crocodile. Oh, they're all big, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, they are, yeah. But they're Called, it's called the Big Crocodile. Uh, and again, it's a large sculpture of a crocodile. It's 18 metres long, that one. About the size of a regular crocodile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's the Big Potato. That's 10 metres long. I wonder if that was an early draft of the Big Mango that just got repurposed. <laughs> just turn it on its side <laughs> or something. Like, just paint it brown. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Big Guitar. That's 12 metres tall. Oh. Yeah, that's in Tamworth in New South Wales. It represents the country music capital of Australia. All right. Right, the one that caught me is the Big prawn. Oh, you've got to enjoy that. That's marvellous. How detailed is it? Got the little legs and the feelers and everything. Little legs, feelers, nine metres in height. Oh, I kind of want to see that one I'd travel to. Imagine the size of the barbie you're going to throw that one on. Oh, yes. Weighs over 35 tonnes. Crikey. That's a big prawn. Uh, there's the big pineapple. Uh, there's the big lobster. Of course. Affectionately known as Larry. Surely someone's made a movie in which all these come to life and fight. <laughs> no, but stop talking because <laughs> that's what we're doing immediately after this episode. Uh, seven metres tall is our Larry. Wow. And finally, Pete, where would we be without a big banana? 
Well, nowhere, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not just a statue either, Pete. It's an actual big banana. <laughs> it's described as a complex. It has a cafe, which I can only imagine sells banana-related goods. You would hope. <laughs> and a souvenir shop. Also commemorative bananas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's only five metres high, though, so the smallest of the big things. Oh, bananas and banana accessories. I'm Sign me up. Why not? I'll go after I've seen the shrimp. That's all the big things. I like the big things very much. Hey, Pete. Hey, Ryan. Just to let you know, I've invited loads of nations round. Nations? Yeah, nations. Yeah, it's part of the research I'm doing for this week's episode on Oceana. Well, how many of these nations are there? Oh, well, they are Polynesians, so I guess that means there's going to be many of them. That's not what Polynesian means, Ryan. Yeah, yeah, it does. So I'm expecting hundreds. Hundreds? We don't have enough space for that. Oh, no, no, don't worry. Most of them are micronation, so they won't take up hardly any room at all. Ryan, that's not what micro... Oh, do you know what? You're an idiot. Hello? Hello, is Ryan home? Oh, you are micro. How rude. Ryan? Yes, Pete? You don't know any big Melanesians, do you? (laughs) No. Oh, enjoy your pie. Well, Ryan, that was all very interesting and I very much enjoyed the big things, but I want you to locate us in space and tell us a bit more about where we're looking at today. So, 90 million years ago, Pete. That's a long time. It was a long time ago. That is the supercontinent of Gondwana. It starts to break apart and tectonic plates are pushing up mountain ranges and there are volcanic eruptions forming islands all the way across the Pacific. Now, it's unclear exactly when early man reaches these islands, but current thinking suggests sometime around 60 to 70,000 years ago. So pretty early man. All right. They had to travel quite a long way to get there, didn't they? Yeah. Tens of thousands of years later, though, Pete, early man has become complex social structures man (laughs) he's he's formed cultures that sort of have a deep connection to the land and are now rich in spirituality and tradition all right but not good at marketing and branding man (laughs) no that comes much later (laughs) about 5,500 years ago though some of the more daring sea folk they set out from modern day Taiwan and they migrate further across the Pacific looking for new lands and over the course of the next few millennia humanity itself spreads as far as as New Zealand. Now, at this point, the Pacific is pretty much chock full of various islands inhabited by various societies of people led by various chiefs and kings who all sought to maintain order and conduct trade or war with neighbouring tribes. The 16th century rocks round. It sees the arrival of the Europeans, Pete. Oh. Have a punt at who arrives first. (laughs) Uh, Well, where are we talking? We're talking about that whole region. The whole region. Well, you're going to get Portuguese then, aren't you? You are, yes. You're going to be infested with Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> Not at first. There's just one, one or two. You see a couple of them. Yeah, there's always more coming once you that happens. You ignore them and then that's it. <laughs> yeah, so no, the Portuguese arrived sometime around 1512 and they're swiftly followed by the Spanish in 1520 with Ferdinand Magellan. You'll have heard of him. Him and his crew, they enter the ocean to the west of South America, which he likes to call the Pacific. Ah. Inspired by what they had seen, they go home, tell everybody in the six. As you rightly point out, the Portuguese and the Spanish return in greater numbers. Ah, they do do that. They will do that. You have to put (laughs) stuff down, otherwise they'll just keep coming. (laughs) Get out the raid. Bare minimum, a national no hawkers, no traders sign. (laughs) (laughs) and so they bring with them explorers and navigators people like de quiros de torres and jansun and they sail around the waters meeting the locals and generally acting european yeah friendly very friendly (laughs) very friendly peoples (laughs) uh the dutch make an appearance uh too abel tasman uh he lands on parts of the australian coast and discovers tasmania new zealand and fiji but it was in the 18th century century when European influences really felt the British and the French rock up. And uh, both send various expeditions to the Pacific, chart the islands, meet Aboriginal leaders, open up trade routes, claim possession of large territory. Yeah. Yeah, The usual. The standard procedure, the SOP, (laughs) the rule book. You get on your ship, you get handed a little book that goes, right, stage one, 
Sign a few treaties. Stage two, lob a few cannibals. Stage three, it's all yours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in 1789, Oceania is the setting for the infamous mutiny on the bounty. Ooh. A bunch of Royal Navy crewmen lead a successful mutiny against their captain, William Bly. They cast him adrift in a rowboat before then going on the run and hiding out on the Pitcairn Islands where they start doing weird things to each other. Yeah, that <laughs> all goes very south, doesn't it? That's, uh, that's why the worst of the chocolate bars was named after that ship in the end. The Bounty Bar. Okay, yeah. I'm yeah. Ready. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Keep up, Ryan, because I'm going to be keeping up this standard of quality throughout the show. Moving on. In 1812, <laughs> French explorer Conrad Maltibrun, he visits the region and he coins the phrase Terre Océanique, which means uh, ocean lands, which is kind of true. Lots of lands in an ocean. It doesn't really narrow it down, though, does it? No, but two years later, that gets shortened by another Frenchman, Adrien Hubert Bru, who simply calls the region Océanique. Ah. He marks that on a map, and that gives rise to the popularity of the name Oceana. Gotcha. All of this attention means that in the 18th and 19th centuries, Britain, France, Germany and Spain, they each undertook massive land grabs in the entire region, and they exert their power over the island nations and colonise pretty much all of them. That's right. Show up with a job lot of flags and get planting. Uh, the First World War hits Oceana in 1914. New Zealand forces land on Samoa and overwhelm a German colony there, and that results in full surrender without any bloodshed. Ooh. That's pretty much World War One. I. I was going to say, I, I didn't recall much in my school days about Oceania in World War One, and now I know why. Uh, sadly, the Second World War had slightly more of a greater impact on Oceania, with the Imperial Japanese invading New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, and other Pacific Islands in 1942. Vicious battles take place here, Pete, and blood is spilled, such as the fighting that takes place at Bitapaka, the Kokoda Track, and the Borneo Campaign. Uh, this is before Japan was ultimately defeated a few years later at the end of the war in 1945. Otherwise, the 20th century is really all about the struggle for independence. Various islands in Oceania look to sort of push out their respective colonisers, with Australia and New Zealand getting there first in the early 1900s, followed by many of the other islands in the latter half of the century. You've got Samoa in 1962, Fiji gaining their independence in 1970, and Vanuatu in 1980. That's recent. It is recent. And that brings us today, Pete, where Oceania struggles to sort of find its place in a globalised world, Economic opportunities are now clashing with the dangers of climate change. Some of the more low-lying islands, as you might be aware, we've talked about in the past, like Kiribati, facing disaster at the hands of rising sea levels. That being said, though, there is a resurgence in respect for their traditional cultures. Generally, there's a broad desire to preserve and to celebrate regions' rich heritage for future generations to come. So, you know what, Pete? Here's hoping that the future for Oceana is as sun-filled and as peaceful as the white sandy beach beaches that it offers you're darn straight i love oceana come on guys you can do it stay above those waters talakai yes steva do you have any idea when we'll reach land well i mean by my measurements not for a while i reckon right right uh, it's just that we've been at sea for quite a while now supplies are getting a bit low and all we could really do with finding some land Oh, oh, well, I'm so sorry this is taking too long for you. You know, navigating by the stars isn't easy, you know. Yes, yes, I, I understand that. I'm just saying it's been many moons since we left home. It's a complicated process. There's a lot of stars. Honestly, I mean, they all look basically the same. They're all just tiny dots in the sky. And, and there's absolutely loads of them. The sky is literally full of stars, Tiva. Honestly, I don't think you realise quite how hard navigating by the stars is. Right, yep, yep, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said anything, I'm, I'm sorry. Fine. It's, it's just... What? Well, don't you think maybe it might help you a bit if just once maybe you took the night shift? I have a sleep disorder! Very good, Ryan, but we're here to discuss the gap and the minding of the gap. What is that all about? The gap? You want to know about? Mind the gap? 
I do, I do. I've, I've been told to watch out for it. <laughs> you do, you need to mind the gap. Well, look, what do we mean by mind the gap? Well, Londoners and visitors to the city know exactly what it is. It is a safety warning at London Underground stations. It's usually found painted on the edge of each platform, and it's also routinely announced over loudspeakers. It's transport for London's way of encouraging passengers to be mindful of their safety as they step between the platform edge and the door to the train which in some cases can result in a significant space between the train and the platform, particularly those platforms that curve. I'm sure, Pete, you've been on the Central Line's eastbound platform at Bank Station. There is a uh, gap there of 37 and a half centimetres, about 15 inches between the platform and the train. <laughs> so if you're not careful and you don't mind that gap, you may well find yourself falling down onto the tracks or at least causing serious injury to yourself. <laughs> Yeah. Now, there isn't any uh, publicly available statistics about how many people injure themselves on uh, the tube, but the Mind the Gap announcement is repeated about 200,000 times a day. That's 73 million times a year and is heard by around 1.4 billion passengers who use the network every year. So it's clearly considered an important safety announcement, and it has been for some time, Pete. In fact, the uh, first recorded use of Mind the Gap was in 1957, when a passenger named Lillian East was attempting to board a train at London's Charing Cross station when she fell through the eight-inch gap between the platform and the train. Injured by her fall, Lillian decides to take London Transport to court. But this failed when it was proven that she had been given several warnings by a platform attendant, a 61-year-old woman called Minnie Smith. Now, the defence lawyer argued that Minnie was a long-term employee at London Underground. She was well known to regular travellers for loudly shouting, Mind the gap! at passengers. (laughs) It was uncanny. It was like she was in the room there for a moment. I thought I'd just channel Minnie there for a second. Yeah, and so much so that her employers referred to her as the best shouting voice at Charing Cross. High praise there. (laughs) (laughs) Now, finding in favour of London Transport, the case was dismissed, and the next day, Minnie became something of a celebrity. The Daily Mirror newspaper called her Minnie with the Mighty Voice. Ah, I like to think that after this experience, she became even more militant and started tackling people away from the gap. Militant mini. (laughs) Militant mind the gap mini. (laughs) Uh, In a later interview, she said, I just naturally happened to have a loud voice. My husband used to say he couldn't get a word in against me. (laughs) Ah, uh, sexism. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, as a result of the case of Lillian East versus London Transport, the phrase mind the gap was brought to the public's attention. But it wasn't until a decade later, when Minnie had retired, that London Transport decided it was going to replace employees just yelling at passengers with (laughs) with an automated announcement. I can't think why. (laughs) And so they commissioned sound engineer Peter Lodge to make the recording. And so, in 1969, Lodge hired an actor and set about recording the warning. I can only imagine that didn't take very long. (laughs) But but, uh, what happened then was, well, after he'd done the recording, he was ready to start playing it. But the actor then started to demand royalty payments. Now, that means, basically, he gets paid each time the announcement (laughs) was played. (laughs) So, yeah, given that, you know, the plans were to use this announcement many times a day across all the platforms across the entire network, Peter just decided to re-record the announcement himself. And so, for the next few years, when the announcement was issued, passengers on the London Underground heard Peter's voice, warning them to... He was a very stiff upper lip kind of fellow, wasn't he? Mind the gap. Well, was he? Oh. Was it mind the gap? (laughs) (laughs) Boy, more the gap, son. (laughs) Uh, No, because you probably haven't heard Peter's recording. And the reason for that is because he was only on there for a couple of years. Because when a new section of the Underground's Northern Line opened up, Peter took the opportunity to hire another actor to re-record the message. So the message you're familiar with is that of Oswald Lawrence, a German actor. 
Oh. Yeah, a German actor who lived in London with his wife, Dr. Margaret McCollum. That seems wrong somehow. I'm sick up! <laughs> <laughs> Although more effective, actually, if it yeah, was like that. I'd be much more inclined to mind the gap if it had that kind of accent going behind it. <laughs> Achtung! I'm sick up! <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yes. So, yes, Oswald Lawrence, he took on uh, the responsibilities and he was happy not to take royalties, unlike the previous guy. <laughs> so his voice becomes the official recording of the Mind the Gap announcement. And it was rolled out across the whole network and it played day after day for decades through the 70s, through the 80s, through the 90s, all the way up until after his death in 2007. Now, one of the nice things about this, Pete, is that his widow, you'll remember, Dr. Mark Margaret McCollum, after his death, was able to go down into the London Underground and still hear his voice. She was able to relive happier times just sitting on the platform as the trains came and went, listening to her husband repeatedly say, Mine's a cap! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love stop nagging. <laughs> <laughs> However, at least she was happy until one day in November 2012, when Margaret made her regular visit down to the platform at Embankment Station, only to find that her husband was no longer the voice of the announcement. It had been replaced by Transport for London by a new digital system. Now, obviously, she was devastated, right? This felt like her husband's second death. And despite being comforted by staff, she just couldn't be consoled. So later, when the employees raised this with upper management, a project was kickstarted to revive Oswald's voice. They delved into the archives, they found the old recordings, they digitised them, and they restored them to the system. So now, if you ever visit the northbound platform and the northern line at Embankment Station, you can hear the voice of Oswald Lawrence warning you to mind the gap. Well, let me tell you, Ryan, I have done exactly that. I once did a tube kind of treasure hunt, and that was one of the things we did was listening to that voice. Yeah, well, there you go. So I can testify to it, and it's a lovely story. Well done. Do your best impression. Go on. Mind the gap! Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. It's, you've just transported me underground. Right? It was exactly like Whoa, that, I'm sure. I've got chills. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Peter, today the phrase mind the gap is kind of part of pop culture. It's one of the reasons why it was included in the Durs later. Uh, tourists regularly have their photos taken with the signs. Insta is filled with hashtag mind the gap with people throwing up V signs next to it. Uh, there are T-shirts, mugs, key rings sold by Transport for London, the tens of thousands, all with mind the gap emblazoned across it. And because of that, Pete, it's become famous throughout the world. And because it's also not subject to copyright, it's become used as a bit of a meme on other joke T-shirts and posters. Things like keep calm and mind the gap, mind the social distancing gap, and things like mind the gender equality gap. Oh, ho, ho, political. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, now, underground and metro systems around the world have even adopted their versions of it for their own announcements. In Hamburg, for example, the S-Bahn station, Berliner Tour, it warns its passengers, Bitte abichten Sie die Luchers weichen Zug und Bahnsteigkante. That seems less uh, snappy and memorable. Was it an English chap saying that? Yeah, I don't want to put that on a T-shirt. It, it means, please mind the gap between train and platform. Ah. <sighs> very efficient it eliminates the doubt as to what gap you might be referring to because <laughs> yeah. as we've established it might have been the wage gap that people were worried about <laughs> in australia sydney trains warn passengers to mind the gap but the, they also add on to that the statistics of how many people have fallen down the gap each year and injured themselves oh i'd find that quite interesting <laughs> listening to oh it's gone up since last yeah. week <laughs> yeah like weird stock market <laughs> chart gap falling is up <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, point is, mind the gap is a familiar saying. But given that there were no underground transport systems in Oceania during 1644 to 1912, I've had to be a bit more creative in my research, Pete. And so with that in mind, I'm going to start our adventure by looking at someone whose job it was to mind the gap. Not prevent someone from falling down a hole like Minnie, but being the bridge between a cultural divide. Oh, very clever. And we'll talk about that after this. Check it out. <laughs> Check it out. <laughs> Are you trying to get a new catchphrase? Yeah. Check it out. <laughs> that should be on the underground. Check it out. Check it out. The gap. The gap. <laughs> Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Right, t-shirt and mug sales from our Mind the Gap range continue to grow, so what can we learn from this? Okay, well, uh, the London Underground is a British institution loved by many. No. Oh, uh, short, snappy sayings with broader interpretations can be fun. No. People's tastes are weird and unpredictable? Yes, but also no. Right. It tells us that people love public announcements. Right. So all we have to do is find the next big thing and watch the cash roll in. And so I present The Future. Unexpected item in bagging area. There you have it. Unexpected item in the baggage area. Yes, it's just like Mind the Gap. It's an announcement. People hear it every day. It's a friendly voice looking out for you. I can see mugs. I can see T-shirts. Dare I say, a movie? Unexpected item in the baggage area, the movie. Starring Liam Neeson. Liam Neeson. Well, would you expect Liam Neeson in your baggage area? I would not. Right, so we're agreed. Project Unexpected Item is a go. I'll set up the finance, you arrange a kickoff. Great. Next, how do we improve sales of the Bitty Beast and Zidi Luka Zweischen Zugen Bahnstikanter range? Increase the marketing budget. No. Big push on social media? No. Liam Neeson. You're goddamn right. An expected item in the baggage area. All right then, Ryan, tell me about this mysterious, magical, not gap gap that you've come up with. It is gap. <laughs> it's, it's a cultural gap. <laughs> it is definitely a gap. <sighs> Come on, Pete. You're supposed to help me out. Eh? Right. Okay. Born on the 7th of November, 1728, Englishman James Cook. He joins the British Merchant Navy as a teenager and then the Royal Navy in 1755. Within two years, Pete, he is posted in North America, where he takes part in an assault on the fortress of Louisbourg in Nova Scotia and a siege on Quebec City. But on his non-fighting days, Cook starts to demonstrate an exceptional capacity for mapping uncharted territory. Basically, within a year of putting down pen to chart paper, uh, map <laughs> paper, <laughs> he, um, he successfully made the first large-scale maps of the Northwest coastline. And these are so accurate that they were then being used by sailors for the next 200 years, well into the 20th century. It's quite the achievement. I hope he also was on some form of commission then. Yeah, well, when you've got no Google Maps and stuff, that's not easy to do. You're just looking sideways on at a bit of land. Right. It's very hard to judge. That's why you hold out for royalties. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, this talent brought him to the attention of the Admiralty and also the scientific community, uh, specifically the Academy known as the Royal Society. Now, both of these groups uh, were very eager at the time for Britain to start making more overseas discoveries. <laughs> Euphemism alert. <laughs> Indeed. Now, being the right man at the right time, Cook finds himself commissioned to undertake an exploratory mission to the Pacific Ocean. Now, excitedly, he writes in his journal that he intends to go not only, in quotes, farther than any man has been before me, but as far as I think it's possible for a man to go. Wow. That's a man <laughs> who did not limit his ambitions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so Cook and the crew of the HMS Endeavour leave England on the 26th of August, 1768. And within a year, they are sailing through the Pacific Ocean, landing at the island of Tahiti on the 13th of April, 1769. Ooh, lovely. It's a beautiful place. That's not a bad stopping off point, is it? <laughs> Can you imagine? So far, so good. Dear diary. <laughs> <laughs> this is all going swimmingly. Yeah, now primarily they were there for scientific reasons. Uh, Cook and his crew set to work observing the local flora and fauna. They observed the transit of Venus, whatever that is. <laughs> they mapped the island and generally leaned into learning more about the Tahitian people, including their language and ways of life. Now, with this all being done, Cook settled into his captain's chair and he opened a sealed envelope which contained instructions from the Admiralty about his next mission. There's no way he didn't steam that open <laughs> on the way. The year that it took him over, it's just sitting there and staring at it. Anyway, the mission was continue on into the South Pacific and look for signs of a possible southern continent known only as Terra Australis. Ooh. Exciting stuff, right? Why did he have to have that sealed? I don't know. Protocol. He's opened it up and gone, 
keep going. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing a great job. <laughs> well done, lad. <laughs> yeah, so Cook gathers his crew together, he tells them the orders, and he gives instructions to go and ready the ship. But while the team run around gathering supplies, Cook is approached by the ship's botanist, a guy called Joseph Banks, who suggests that Cook consider bringing a new member of crew aboard with them. Asked who Banks has in mind, he points out an islander called Tupaya. Now, Tupaya was born around 1725 on a small island near Tahiti, but at this time, now aged 44 years old, he lives on Tahiti as a high priest and is considered by many as the wisest of their people. He is their font of knowledge on the origin of the cosmos, their ancient history, how the calendar works. He's an extremely accomplished navigator. In fact, it was said that Tupaya had an incredible memory, with knowledge that included a list of all the local islands, including their size, locations of their reefs and harbours, whether they were inhabited or not, the names of the tribal chief or king that lived there, and what types of foods were available to get from there. I'm beginning to see why they might have wanted this chap along for the ride. Yeah. What's more, Tupaya knew the directions to get to each island, the star paths to follow, and the amount of time it would take to get there. He is the chat GPT of <laughs> Cook Sage. So, given all of this, it was perhaps no surprise that Joseph Banks had struck up a good relationship with this guy. Now, at first, Cook refuses to allow Tobia to join the expedition. Why would you let have this lesser man who just happens to know literally everything you need to know? <laughs> yeah. Well, he says, we're on a budget. It's financial reasons. Oh, it was a cost-cutting measure, it was it? It was a cost-cutting measure, yeah. <laughs> he couldn't afford a new crew member. <laughs> so Banks, rather remarkably, is determined determined to bring him along and agrees to be financially responsible for Tobias' welfare. Even, and this is a bit weird, offering to share a cabin with him. Oh, okay. <laughs> Changes the story dramatically, but carry on. <laughs> he really liked him. He's very wise. <laughs> <laughs> He knows how to get places. He knows how to do things. <laughs> <laughs> Show me your star path. <laughs> Puts Cook's decision not to bring him in a new light, doesn't it? It does a little bit. <laughs> right, now, still unconvinced, Cook sets Tupaya a test. He asks him to map the local area around Tahiti. And within days, Tapaya hand delivers a chart that shows not only Tahiti, but all 130 islands within a 2,000 mile radius, <laughs> <laughs> naming 74 of them. It's going to take you a while to check that, though, isn't it? <laughs> Finally, somewhat reluctantly, <laughs> Cook welcomes Tapia on board the Endeavour. But they have to keep the door open. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and in August of 1769, they all set off together to discover more of Polynesia. To discover things that they've already had mapped out because the guys already know it's there, but yeah, carry on. <laughs> now, you might be wondering why Tapia would be so interested in joining Cook's crewpeat. Well, I've half a mind to <laughs> why he might, but carry on. <laughs> By the way, Captain, I think we should bring this guy. <laughs> oh, come on, Banks, not again. You always do this. <laughs> <laughs> he can share my room. I don't mind. For the crew, for the good of the expedition. <laughs> 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 right now pete you might be wondering <laughs> <coughs> i might be i'm wondering things ryan yeah okay come on now you might be wondering, Pete, why Tapaya would be so interested in joining Cook's crew. But the answer seems to be that his people had recently been defeated in a war by a neighbouring people called the Bora Bora, a conflict which had resulted in Tapaya losing all of his land. By helping the British, he reasoned that this might be seen as a quid pro quo way of assuring their help in winning back his home from the Bora Bora. Yeah, well, that makes sense. It's like, look at my new friends. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, it makes sense. 
Now, whether Cook knew this and gave Tobiah the impression he would help in exchange for his help, we don't know. But we do know that both Cook and Banks had privately discussed bringing Tobiah back to England with them as a present for the Royal Society as a form of wild anthropological curiosity. That's not what he was expecting at all, was it? <laughs> Guess what? We're going to kidnap you. Thanks for your help. Yeah. Uh, you're ours now. <laughs> yeah, you curiosity. <laughs> anyway, regardless, before heading south, Cook Banks, Tapia, and the crew of the Endeavour spend the next several weeks travelling through the various islands around Tahiti, uh, during which time Tapia navigates them safely through various dangerous reefs, acts as an interpreter and a mediator with tribal chiefs that they meet. He introduces the officers, he walks them through all of these complicated, strange ceremonies, and basically assures their safety wherever they go. Now, clearly impressed with his new crewman, within a month, Cook has Tobiah working on a much larger chart, one that would map the wider Pacific Ocean. Wow. Yeah. Do you know the neighbouring area? Yeah. <laughs> now, Tobiah's influence was immediate. It was felt by all. Banks revealed in his journal that we wake to see where Tobiah will bring us to next. So really, he kind of had his hand at the steering wheel oh, thing. That's... What's that called? The big wheel. The tiller. Yeah, he basically had his hand on the tiller. Well, I suspected as much. <laughs> oh, Tapia. <laughs> oh, Tapia. Yeah. Eventually, though, when Tapia suggests that the ship heads east towards Tonga, Cook regains control of the direction of the ship again, and he orders that they waste no more time and start to head south in search of Terra Australis. Here they fall into unknown territory and Tapia has to sort of stand on deck at night, looking to the stars to find the right path. He collects signs from migrating birds, he studies the ocean's currents, and with all this information together, he helps the Endeavour navigate 1,854 nautical miles, that's 3,433 kilometres, from Tahiti to New Zealand, a land which Cook presumed was Terra Australis, and so, eager to be the first to get there himself, he left Tapia aboard and rowed to shore with his crew. I've done terrifically! <laughs> yes. Now, this was a mistake because almost immediately Cook finds himself in hot water with the local Maori people. Uh, He's unable to interpret their language or their protocols. And so, as you might expect, a fight breaks out between the two groups. And in the resulting melee, one of Cook's men shoots and kills a young Maori chief. Oh, that's not going to have any consequences. Actually, Pete. It does. Oh, no. <laughs> it was a total disaster. Cook returns back to the ship and the next day brings Tapia with him. <laughs> yeah. Tapia meets with the local Maori and he does his best to sort of talk them down and smooth things over, but it's a case of too little too late. The hostilities continue, they heat up, and again, the British shoot at the Maori, killing even more before eventually they jump back on their boat and leave. A success! <laughs> <laughs> Lovely weekend. Long weekend away. <laughs> yeah. So with their tails between their legs, Cook and the crew of the Endeavour move off along the coast of New Zealand with a growing realisation that they might have a problem here because they're going to need to resupply food and water, right? And the real problem here was that faster than they travelled across the ocean, word was spreading of their violent arrival amongst the Maori. Ooh. And so locals are continuing to refuse them safe harbour as they move down the coast. So facing doom, Cook's one saving grace in all of this is Tapia, who had gained this reputation among the Maori as a high priest of respect and honour. He hadn't been involved in any of this stuff, and when he'd come, he spoke their language, he understood where they were coming from, so they, they treated him with honour. And as such, as they moved along the coast, loads of inquisitive locals would come out to come and meet Tapia. And soon, with his help, the endeavour was again fully laden with supplies, something that Cook knew he would not have been able to do without him. <laughs> yeah. And so, Pete, eventually, in March of 1770, Cook leaves New Zealand, and following Tapia's directions, he sails west for one month and eventually arrives at the coast of Australia. Celebrations were had by all, Pete. Hurrah! We made it. We found the unknown continent. With barely any help at all. <laughs> by ourselves. <laughs> 
But this success was short-lived though, because having successfully minded the gap for Cook across Oceania, no. Tobias now found himself entirely redundant. After all, Australia was new territory. He had no knowledge of the place or of the people that lived there. He tried several times to speak with the local indigenous people, but the differences between them were just too great. The local people considered him as strange as his European shipmates. Oh. As such, his role of mediator and translator and diplomat kind of just vanished, and Cook, Banks and the others on the ship just marginalised him. As they travelled up Australia's coastline, Topia fell ill with scurvy, and by mid-November, he was dead. Oh no! I thought they were at least going to make him Queen's pet. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Good news though, Pete. Cook and Banks return back to England, and they are welcomed as heroes. His successes plauded as British bravery and ingenuity, with next to no mention of Tapia, despite his contribution being written about extensively in the captain's logs and the various crew journals. <laughs> Basically, he was conveniently forgotten for about 200 years until Cook's journals were re-examined and his contribution was noted. It must have been an amazing find for a historian. Like, who's this Tapia guy he keeps referring yeah. to? Hold on. This isn't I've the story I was taught at school. <laughs> exactly. Now, today, some people do say that Tobias' contribution has been overblown and that Cook and his crew do deserve a lot of the praise they've received for world exploration. But whatever the case, it's absolutely certain that without Tapia's expertise, knowledge and wisdom, helping to mind the gap across across the cultural divide of the Pacific Ocean, we might be telling a different story about the discovery of the lost southern continent of Australia. Oh, jolly good. Well done. Well done. That was a proper gap. It was minded. And it was a jolly good story. Excellent stuff. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you, Peter. Shall I open up my sealed envelope? <laughs> yes. Keep going. <laughs> good, because that's what I'm going to do after this. <laughs> Hello, I am Captain Cook. From England. Oh. I, Captain Big Man, on boat from across water. Oh, I don't know. You give me food? Ah, oh, this isn't working. Tapia, translate for me, would you? Uh, of course, Captain. <clears throat> Greetings, I am Captain James Cook, representative of His Majesty, the greatest king on earth, and I demand you replenish my ship's supplies, etc., etc., and so on and so forth. Right. Hi, John. Oh, hi, Tapia. Uh, this guy here says, uh, have you got any spare food? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, he says he's uh, pleased to meet you, Captain, and would be delighted to help. Great. Well, tell him that he's a bloody lovely savage. Captain says, thanks very much. Oh, no worries. Now, also tell him that in return for his support, I will, of course, happily gift him items from our vessel. I, I really don't think that's necessary, Captain. Nonsense. Tell him that we'll give him, uh, I don't know, some of that old rope that's lying around. Oh, they'll love that. Right. John, Whitey here wants to give you a gift, but honestly, it's just some old rope. So can you just nod and smile for me? Oh, yeah, no problem, mate. All right. Oh, look how happy he is. Such a simple soul, eh, Tapia? He sure is, sir. You know what? I'm going to let everyone back home know about this marvellous place. The British will be back, and in greater numbers. Tell him that, Tapia. Yeah, John, look, you really need to get everyone to pack up their stuff and move out of here pretty sharpish. Oh, uh, right, though. Uh, is he Portuguese, then? Uh, basically, yeah. Oh, OK, mate. No problem. Well, that went well. All right, Ryan, well, Tapia's story was fascinating and uh, very gripping. So what else have you got that can top that? OK, well, I have one other story to share with you all, Peter. So today, Australia is largely known by cities like Canberra and Darwin, Sydney and Melbourne, all places that have evolved into sprawling metropolises around the coast of the country. The reason being that taken as a whole, the coast is the most temperate and livable area for humans to live comfortably. The rest of Australia, around 81% of it, <laughs> is considered rangeland, commonly known as the outback. It covers the interior of the island where the temperatures are hot and summers are long and it results in these vast lands of arid and semi-arid desert. But that doesn't mean that people don't live there, Pete. They shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Estimates vary, Pete, but today somewhere between 400 and 600,000 people call these 
rangelands home. And Central Australia, which is the collective name for it, has been home to humanity for a long, long time, with the earliest humans living there around 40,000 years ago. That's a tough living. Now, these indigenous people are known as the Aranda, and they are still living there today in an area that covers around 120,000 square kilometres. That's one-fifth the size of France. Now, they call the land Umpatwi, and it's an area which oral history describes as having been created by primordial caterpillar beings. Yeah, it makes sense. Originally a semi-nomadic people, the Aranda spent their time crossing the desert landscape, following the natural flow of food and water. They knew all of the lands intimately, the best watering holes, the best hunting grounds for kangaroo and emu, the best areas for picking fruits and nuts and seeds, but they also knew all the places which held a special significance in spirit spiritual customs and their beliefs. Uh, you know, locations where knowledge would be passed down onto the next generation. All right. The Aranda were, and in some cases still are, a people that were deeply linked with their land. It was central to their understanding of the world, their place within it, and the laws that govern them. For them, the land is alive and sentient, filled with the presence and power of their ancestors. And as you might expect, Pete, the landscape is therefore filled with sacred sites imbued with the power of these ancestral beings. And one of the most sacred sites is a long series of mountains called Chaoritje that range across the landscape in parallel for about 644 kilometres. It's about 400 miles. Big old mountain range. Now, they're famous for their burnt orange colour, the result of the red quartzite in the rock. But the mountain range, known today as the McDonnell Ranges, was created around 300 and 400 million years ago, uh, since which they've eroded down into form the series of peaks that we see today, reaching up to heights of around 1,500 metres, you know, 5,000 feet tall. Okay. So pretty tall. And in an otherwise flat landscape, these mountains can be seen from really far away. It's a natural wall of rock that separates the lands to the north from those in the south. And amid the peaks of these mountain range are gorges, chasms, watering holes, each of them eroded away thanks to the continual flow of running water from the rain or from rivers over hundreds of thousands of years. And it's these areas which provide the Aranda with some of their most important spirits sites, many of which have been marked with rock art painted by ancient ancestors who used ochre sourced from the mountain to paint the walls. We've been writing on walls since the beginning and we continue to do so. We do. Now, one of these sites, perhaps the most significant sacred site in the mountain range, is Antherwerk. It's a small, flat piece of ground between two cliff walls that is considered by the Aranda to be the origin place of their godlike caterpillar beings. The legend is written large on the walls of the cliffs in the form of a painted ochre caterpillar wriggling across the ground. It's known today as Emily Gap, and it is one of the many stopping points for hikers to rest and take photos as they walk through the range. But I want to talk about another area of importance to the Aranda, a place that was revered as spiritually significant. It's called Hevetry Gap, but known to the Aranda as Untaripe. It's similar to Emily Gap in that it's this small, level space between the mountains, and it was created by a flow of a river which has, over millennia, carved a path through the rock, leaving steep cliffs on either side. It's more than just a landmark. It features prominently in their stories. It's considered a spiritual pathway, right? as you might imagine, between two big mountains to walk through this pathway, and it embodies that deep connection that they have with the land. But in the case of Ntarip, the place is unique in their tradition because it states that it must only be visited and crossed by men. Oh. Women of the Arundel people are specifically told to mind the gap. <laughs> nice work. <laughs> and that's because their culture states that men and women have clear distinctions in roles and responsibilities when it comes to spirituality. Well, it did until around the 18th century. Any idea why? <laughs> Is it because a load of Europeans arrived and messed things up? Well, Pete, let me tell you. In the 18th century, a bunch of Europeans arrived <laughs> and messed things up. I had a hunch. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Across the arid central lands comes the wandering form of Europe. Having arrived in Australia and settled on the coast some time back, the Europeans were now turning their attention inland, and they were sending explorers out to chart the country. In the 1860s, one of the more notable explorers was a Scottish guy called John McDool Stewart, and he made several attempts to try and cross the continent from south 
to north. Lured by this large mountain range in the distance, he heads there and he passes by in Taraip during these expeditions. He finally succeeds in his cross-continent walk in 1862, and uh, his charts and his maps are taken by William Whitfield Mills, an English surveyor who in 1870 was busy building a telegraph line that would connect Adelaide to Darwin by passing directly through Central Australia. It was a path that meant crossing the Macdonnell mountain range. So Mills and his companion, Gilbert McMinn, they arrive at the mountains in March of 1871 and following the river, they find the gap. Now, realising it would be the perfect location to feed their telegraph line through over land rather than having to go over the peaks of the mountains, Mills marks the location for construction and calls it Hevitree Gap, a tribute to his childhood school, Hevitree School, in Devon in England. I find that weird, but carry on. <laughs> yeah, me too. I did too. That's why I, no- that's why I noted it. <laughs> yeah, he really loved his school, I guess. Or he was just really running out of names to name things. Maybe. He, he had a- walked halfway across the continent yeah. naming everything in his way. He'd already done his mum, his uncle, his cousins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, side note, by the way, while he's there, he also names a nearby watering hole, Alice Springs. Ah. which uh, you probably have heard of. He identifies it as a place of great opportunity for those seeking to settle. And today, Alice Springs is an important town with a reported population of around 30,000 people. Ah. So he wasn't wrong. Anyway, during the time of exploration, the Arunda met with the Europeans and they warned them about the cultural significance of Heavy Tree Gap, as they called it. But construction continued anyway, and the Gap soon had several telegraph lines swinging through them on their enormous route across country. Unfortunately, though, the uh, telegraph lines were just the start, Pete, because Mills's recommendation for settlers to come to Alice Springs meant that Europeans started to flood the area, and the Gap was used on a daily basis by the settlers to move their cattle around to feed and drink from the river. And it didn't stop there. In 1912, plans went underway for a uh, railway line to pass through the Gap, something which eventually happened in 1929, and uh, rail was then joined by road too, with the construction of the Stuart Highway, which also passed through Hevertree Gap. Oh, and a footpath, <laughs> which has no gender restrictions either. Well, you know, I do say Europeans come and mess things up, but I do also like the ability to phone across country and drive around a bit. Yeah. Look, fortunately, today, there is much more recognition of the cultural significance of these sacred sites, you know, places like Hevertree Gap. Uh, And there is legal protection now in place with acts like the native title and land rights and the heritage legislation, all of which are designed to sort of prevent the development of these protected sites. But with that in mind, in 2016, the Northern Territory Department of Infrastructure Planning and Logistics undertook research to predict future traffic conditions for the Stuart Highway, and they realised that as the primary route connecting the north and south of Australia, it needed to be upgraded by duplicating the size of the road, including the part that passes through Hevertree Gap. Ah, the Hevertree Bypass. (laughs) (laughs) That's exactly right. So one of the proposals they have is to build a flyover that passes through the middle of the gap. (laughs) However, there is another more sensible option, in my opinion, uh, which is to dig a tunnel directly through the mountain, right? Technology has now got to a point where we can dig through mountains, and so that is now a potential option. And it would mean that they could take up the rail line and the road and, of course, the footpath and allow Hevertree Gap to return to nature as everything else just goes under or through the mountain. I'm told that no decisions have been made yet on these developments uh, and that consultations are underway with the Aranda people. So with that in mind, I'm sure their wishes to mind the gap will be taken into consideration for the future. Nice work. You found a gap. How how delighted were you when you came across this tale? Pretty delighted. (laughs) Anyway, Peter, there you go. That was Mind the Gap in Oceana during 1644 to 1912. Wow, I loved it. You satisfied me in every possible way, like a shipmate might. (laughs) Don't say it. (laughs) Well, Ryan, that was excellent. You answered all my gap-related questions and more. In fact, you introduced new concepts and metaphorical gaps and things that I would never have thought of. So that was terrific. Well done, Ryan. Pat yourself on the back. And on the forehead. (laughs) Now punch yourself in the face. Oh, cool. <laughs> I really did. I did not it. think you. Were... Oh my oh. gosh! What? 
<laughs> oh, that really actually hurt. I thought you were going to knock yourself unconscious then. Oh, uh, my jaw's sore now. I'm, I'm going to stop giving you instructions, I think. <laughs> yeah. I like this new addition to the episode. This is good. <laughs> All right, thank you, bye. Once a jolly engineer came across a sacred gap Landscape as lovely as any you'd see And he sang as he measured and planned a concrete overpass I'll make it modern for you and for me Making it modern, making it modern Bulldoze the hills and uproot every tree And we'll lay lots of pipes And we'll tarmac all the ground around Making it modern for you and for me Now you can drive at high speed across the overpass Over the gap that you can't really see If you feel just a hint of the sadness of the ancestors Try to ignore it and rush home for tea Making it modern, making it modern Bulldoze the hills and uproot every tree And we'll lay lots of pipes and we'll tarmac all the ground around Making it modern for you and for me Well, Ryan, that was good stuff. But as ever, it's time to look to the future. The future being the next episode. You've got to dursilate me, my friend. I'm going to dursilate you right away. Well, there's no time to lose. Let's hit that button. All right, Peter, here we go. Your place is... The entirety of Africa. Africa? That's, Africa. That's got to be something, right? That's pretty much... Africa. That's a big chunk of the world. I'll, I'll take that. OK, uh, do you want a time period? Yes, please. OK, your time period is... 201 million to 145 million years ago, and that's the Jurassic. Jurassic Park! Jurassic Park. <laughs> exactly. Oh, that's got to be easy, right? Surely there's dinosaurs and parks. Peter, and... As well you know, it all depends on the topic. And we're about to find your topic out now. Be football, be soccer or something. <laughs> okay, and your topic is... Peace. 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 Peace, man. Peace. Peace yeah, on Earth. The Jurassic. I mean, I've seen Jurassic Park. Very peaceful movie. Very peaceful movie. <laughs> Dinosaurs, famous for their peace. All right. I'm sure I can find something about that, surely. All right, Pete. Well, you have got peace in Africa during the Jurassic. I wish you luck, my man. I am on it. Tell us about dinos, Pete. I will. Come back next week. Da, 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 da. <laughs> All right, that is it. That's our show for this week. Thank you, everyone, for listening. If you would like to get in touch about any of the things we've talked about on the show, or if you just want to say hi, you can reach us by going through our website, hhepodcast.com, or email Pete and Ryan at hhepodcast.com. Yeah, we do love to hear from you, and you never know, you might end up featured on a future show. And if you're on Mastodon, Instagram, Facebook, or X, you can find us at HHE Podcast. And if you subscribe to those, you're going to get an alert every time we post extra content, like facts we didn't use, photos from the show, and some pictures that Tapia drew on his journey with Cook. Oh, that's a promise. And of course, we'll be back again soon with... The Verdict. But until then, a huge thank you to you, Ryan. And a huge thanks to you, Pete. And that's it. I guess all that's left to say is... Mind the Gap. History happened everywhere. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Pete. Uh, what time is the big meeting? Uh, midday. And what time is it now? Oh, uh, well, the small hand's on the 11, and the big hand is on the 9, so... 11.45. It's 11.45, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 11.45. And you're sure we're going to make it in the next 15 minutes? Yeah. Because this meeting is really important, Ryan, and we've been on the tube for quite a while now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it'll be fine. Will it? Yeah. You see, we're on the northern line, heading out of Charing Cross, and then we get the district line to Bank, change there, and get the central line to Liverpool Street. Right. Where we get out and get on the Metropolitan Line. Oh, OK. 
at Baker Street, we change on to the Piccadilly line to Westminster, then the Jubilee line to Waterloo, where we hop on the Northern line to Embankment, and we'll just walk to Charing Cross from there. Wait, Charing Cross? You, you said we just passed through Charing Cross? Oh, yeah, but there was an announcement, and it said, mind the gap, and, well, I don't want to fall down a gap, so we're going to find the nearest station without a gap, and then we can get off the train. Ryan, right, the only gap around here is between your ears. Aardvark, see? Exactly. Mind the gap. Mind the gap. Hello, uh, Stephen. Uh, could you do a quicker one? Mind the gap. Could you leave quite a long gap between the words the and gap? Mind the gap. Hello, lovely YouTube folks. This is a special message just for you. Yeah, thanks for listening all the way to the end. Now, if you enjoyed the show, please let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And don't forget to take a moment to hit that like and smash subscribe. Hit that like? Yeah. Smash subscribe? Yeah, that's what people say. Do they though? Yeah, only the cool kids. And you think you're the cool kids, do you? No, we're the cool kids. Oh yeah, I suppose we are. All right, smash that like button, people. Smash it real good. Oh yeah, nice.